That's the story right there, right? He is risen. He is risen. Amen. And because he is, we have life. And uh, because he got out of the grave, we too can get out of the grave. And uh, not only now in our lives, but in the end. So let's look at this uh, from the scriptures a little bit. And you wouldn't mind turning to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. In, in uh, this past week, in preparation for what we did on Wednesday with communion, I was studying the sufferings of Christ, and, and I have to admit, it was a very difficult time for me. It was, it was, uh, I was weepy most of the week because of seeing how my Lord suffered. But uh, then getting to look at the resurrection, yeah, you know, it's, it's wonderful, just absolutely wonderful. And one of the things that really stood out to me was how much, how much uh, the story, hey, Dan, how much the story was... Uh, uh, how many women were involved in the, the resurrection of Christ. I mean, women are really prominent in this whole thing. Really, it starts really before Jesus is even taken into captivity. He, he comes to, this, um, to Mary's house, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus, you know, the two sisters and the brother. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Jesus goes to the house, and while he is in the house, Martha, of course, is the one fixing the meal. She's the Italian in the family. And uh, Mary goes over to Jesus and she anoints his feet with this precious oil. And then, um, and then she wipes his feet with her hair. She apparently had very long hair. Such a loving thing. Really a messianic type of thing. Treating him as to who he was. Being the Messiah. Here she is humbly before him, laying down before him and washing his feet with his most precious ointment. And then drying it with her hair. Of course, she got criticized for that. Judas said the money could have been sold, you know, the ointment could have been sold, the money given to the poor, but Judas was scheming because he was um, trying to steal. You know, he was in charge of the treasury. And then later on in that, that was six days before he was killed. Uh, later on in the week, he had another meal or another time we went to Simon the leper's place. And at Simon the leper's, another woman who's not named, we don't know her name, she came in and anointed his head with oil. And again, a very messianic, wonderful thing to do, acknowledging, these two women acknowledged this was the, the Lord, and this was the Savior, this was the, this was the King, this was the Chosen One. They were tender and loving and kind to him. And I wanted to show you this. When he said to, in John 12, 7, Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. That's when... When uh, Mary put the ointment on his feet and they criticized, he said, leave her alone. She's doing this for, not for my death, but for my burial. And then likewise with the other woman at Simon the leper's house, Jesus was aware of this. They were criticizing. Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Again, it was for his burial. These women were anointing his body from head to toe for his burial. And I don't think any of them understood what he was talking about as we read the records. But I, I love that these women were so tender and so loving and so respectful of him right before he was taken and so badly abused and so disgustingly treated as a person how they so badly treated him and mocked him and spit in his face and did all that they did to him, put him up on the cross where he hung from 9 in the morning till 12 at night, uh, 12, I'm sorry, from 9 in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Then he died. And in Mark chapter 15, in verse 42, when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up the courage and went before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. This is a, just a tremendous man. The irony of it is, is that he is a member of the council. The council are the ones, the 70 elders of Israel that are responsible for torturing Jesus and ultimately for his death. 
But it says of this man in Luke 23, a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plan and their action. He wasn't, he wasn't involved in the whole torture and the killing of Jesus. That's not who he was. He's someone that really believed in that Jesus was the king and he believed in the kingdom. Again, back here in Mark chapter 15, verse 44, and Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time. And summoning the, the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascending and ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the, the body to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and, and, and laid him in a tomb which he had been, been hewed out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. This, this Joseph of Arimathea, again, he was a member of the council. And if you, if you studied this the suffering thing, and we talked about it on Wednesday, you remember the hypocritical members of the council who wouldn't go into the, the uh, Antonio fortress because they didn't want to defile themselves before the Passover so that they could eat the Passover. It didn't bother them that they had just tortured somebody all night long and were trying to have him murdered. That didn't bother them, but they, did, they had this hypocritical thing of not wanting to go in because you weren't allowed to be near the Gentiles if you were going to participate in the Passover. Well, Joseph of Arimathea, he didn't care about that. He didn't care about that at all. As a matter of fact, it says in the Old Testament that if you touch a dead body or you're near a dead body before the Passover, you cannot eat the Passover lamb. And Joseph didn't care about that either. When he went to the cross and took Jesus off the cross, I can't imagine how emotional it must have been for him, how extremely difficult it would have been to disengage his hands and his feet from these spikes and take his broken, beaten body that was so badly bruised, it wasn't even recognizable as a human being. And he carried this man, he carried our Lord in his arms, while the rest of Israel had already killed the Passover lamb and were preparing the lamb to eat that night. Joseph of Arimathea was carrying the last Passover lamb to his grave. Look at um, John, please, 19. John 19. Joseph wasn't alone. There were, Nicodemus was, with, was involved in this too. In, Joseph, in John 19, verse 38, And these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, I'm in John chapter 19, verse 38, And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, put a, a secret for one fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Verse 39, And Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. I, you know, I, I skipped something I wanted to bring to your attention. What, I, what we read earlier in that other gospel is that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, was watching as they put him in the tomb. And uh, there's a lot of Marys involved in this. There's Mary, the mother of God. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, I mean, oh, Jesus. <laughs> hey. <laughs> wow. After all these years, slip right back in there. There's Mary Magdalene, there's Mary the mother of Joseph and James, there's Mary <laughs> the mother of Jesus, and then there's Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus. There's a lot of Marys. Um. <laughs> John 19. So uh, verse 39, and Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, and about 
a hundred pounds worth. He was going to prepare his body for, which was in their culture, was to prepare his body for the grave. But the fact of the matter is, what we just read was both of those women had already done that before he even died. But so they, they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in the linen wrap and, and with spices. And it was the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he, had, he was crucified, there was a garden. And in that garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. And therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. It was the day of preparation for the Passover. They had killed the Passover. They were preparing for it. At nightfall, we'll begin a new day. Look at Matthew 27, please. I think it's wonderful to see how this whole thing unfolded. In Matthew chapter 27... The other side of the story, 2762. Now, on the next day after Jesus was taken down and Jesus was buried, the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember when he was still alive, the, that deceiver said, After three days I am going to get up again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you talk about being delusional. You talk about missing the mark. You talk about idiots. These guys thought that they were going to prevent Jesus from getting up from the dead by putting guards by the tomb. Talk about a bad job. <laughs> Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Then in, in verse 2, three days and three nights later, after Jesus was put into the ground, Three days and three nights later, according to Matthew 12, 40, as, as the, as, uh, what's his name was in the, the, what was his name? Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the sea monster's stomach. So Jesus would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus died on Wednesday, and now we're talking about it being Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And here's what happened in verse 2, Matthew 28, verse 2, and behold... A severe earthquake had occurred. So there's this earthquake, and I don't, I don't do sound effects as well as John, so I'll spare you. <laughs> a severe earthquake occurred, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the gods shook for fear of him and became like dead men. <laughs> The, the angel, angels usually appeared like men, but it was like lightning. You have this earthquake, you're guarding the tomb. There's an earthquake, then an angel appears like lightning, and his clothing are as white as snow, and he jumps up and sits on top of the stone. These poor souls, they just froze. I don't know that they got to see Jesus come out of the grave. I kind of doubt they did. And no, this is the only record of him literally getting up. This is the only, no one really saw him rise from the dead except for that angel, and I doubt these two soldiers saw it. But that's the literal time of Jesus getting up from the dead. And if you go 24 hours, it was probably Saturday afternoon, sometime between 3 and 6 o'clock in the evening. Now look at... Um, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, 
They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. She wasn't there when the angel did this. She didn't see Jesus in his resurrected body. She goes there, the stone's gone, and he's not in the tomb. She's all shook up. She runs to Peter and tells Peter, and now watch, Peter and the disciple whom he loved, which we now know is the John. He wrote the Gospel of John. So Peter and the other disciple, verse 3, went forth, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. The other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping in and looking, he saw the linen wrappings lie, lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter also came, following him, and he entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. I mean, the, the one guy, I guess, was in a little better shape than Peter. He got there. He's looking in. Peter <laughs> ran right into the tomb. And Jesus is not there. Just the wrappings are there. Now, I, there is some debate as to what we're talking about because when, uh, as far as the wrappings being there, uh, some think it looks like this. Others think that when the tomb, when... Uh, when um, um, when Nicodemus came and wrapped him in the, you know, prepared him for death, that he would have wrapped him similar to the way a mummy would be wrapped. And uh, there is the thought that lit Jesus literally came out of those grave clothing and they were there. We'll see in a minute. They folded up the napkin thing to the side and his grave clothing was still there. And uh, so they run in and, and uh, you know, they're, wow, the body's not here. And then it says in verse 8, so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb and then also entered, he saw and believed. He's the first one that believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. For as of yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must raise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their homes. Well, they went away, it really couldn't have been to their homes. The, the, the Greek word for homes is not is not that's usually used is not there they just went away is basically what it says but mary was standing outside the tomb weeping and so as she wept she stooped and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting at one at the head and one at the feet where the body of jesus had been laying and they said to her woman why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have, taken my, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll go take him away. Miss Mary was a piece of work. I mean, she looks into this thing. She's so upset. I mean, this all happens like this. She's so upset. She looks in. She sees an angel, and the angel says to her, Why are you crying? Well, they took my, the Lord's body away. And then she hears the noise behind her. She thinks it's a gardener. She says, What would you do with him? You tell me where he is, I'll go get him myself. And she would have. You know, she would have went and got him. She would have figured it out. I love this woman. She's fantastic. <laughs> and Jesus said to her in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rehoboam, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. <laughs> you get the impression of what happened. When she realized it was Jesus, she just ran into his arms. <laughs> she wasn't going to let go of him. He says, let me go, Mary. <laughs> stop clinging to me. I can, can you imagine the depths of despair that she was experiencing? Thinking that how despicable that they would steal his body. And how, you know, she was overwhelmed. She had been mourning for three days, and now the body is gone. And then the next thing you know, she's seeing angels, and she sees Jesus. I mean, you talk about going from the bottom to the top. I mean, she must have been, woo -hoo! 
Then Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he, that he had said these things to her. <laughs> Let me remind you of what it says in Luke chapter 8. It says, and he, uh, this is earlier on in Jesus' ministry, he was going about around to every city and village teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom with the twelve, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. This Mary Magdalene, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, you hear it in traditional religious that, that she was a prostitute, but there's nothing in the scriptures that say that. It doesn't say that, but it does say that she had seven demons. This is a woman that was really, really struggling. And Jesus ministered to her, and she stayed devout and loyal to him, even to the point when he died. And, and now we see that she's the first person to see Jesus in his resurrected body. The first one to believe was John, whom he loved. But the first one that seen him was Mary Magdalene. I read this record, and I think there's room for me. You know, that if, if, if someone like her, who had seven demons, and I'm sure I had my boatload of them too, could, could be embraced by the Lord, why not me? Why not you? It's a wonderful record. Go to Luke chapter 24, please. Well, I didn't read that. Um, while you're going there, I'm going to read verse 18. But Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and he had said these things. And then up here, she went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that he was alive, he had been seen by her, they refused to believe her. They didn't believe her. She thought, they thought, they must have thought she was beside herself, just so overwhelmed with grief. But you can, that had to be a stretch. I mean, because, could you imagine what she looked like? She had just seen Jesus, you know, <laughs> he's alive, he's alive. And these guys said, well, she's just out of her mind. She's just. <laughs> In Luke 24, verse 1, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. They here is talking about the other women. The other women that were there with the disciples when Mary came, they didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, but they, they wanted to anoint his body, so they were willing to go back with Mary to the tomb. The apostles, they just thought she was crazy. They didn't believe that he was up. So they, now of course Mary knew that he didn't need to be anointed. He had already been. Verse 2 and they found the stone rolled away and the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in da dazzling clothing. Again, two angels. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. And then the three greatest words that have ever been spoken. He has what? He has risen. Isn't that great? He is not here. He has risen. Here are these women. He is risen. Return. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day raised again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Johanna and Mary the mother of James. James is the mother of Joseph. This is the same woman from earlier. And also other women with them, were telling these things to the apostles. 
Now, again, they got to be unbelievably excited. But their words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. Doesn't speak too well of the men in this story here, does it? <laughs> it speaks abundantly well of the women. Then Peter got up and ran to the tombs, and stooping in, looked in, and he saw the linen wrapping only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. So Jesus, Jesus went away, I mean, Peter went away again. You know, he, it's not, he hasn't believed yet. He's still, what's going on here? The women, they're in tune. Let's go to Matthew 28, please. We're going to come back here to Luke, but let's go to Matthew 28. In verse 5. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he, is, he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. So go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly and fear and great joy and ran to report to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. The other record didn't show us that. They're on their way to go tell the other apostles, and Jesus appears to these women. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, while these women, they have just seen Jesus, they're on their way to tell the disciples. Now look what it says here in verse 11. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and the, the council together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say, His disciples came at night and stole Him away while He was sleeping. And this should... Now these are the guys that saw the angel. The stone rolled back the lightning, the earthquake. He's saying, now, here's, what you, well, here's a large sum of money. We're going to pay you off. Verse 14. And this should come to the governor's ears. We will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day, the day of the writing. Isn't that incredible? It reminds me of what was this verse in Luke chapter 16. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone raises from the dead. Can you imagine being one of these soldiers and knowing this and then taking money in the stead of believing? I guess people are, you know... <laughs> Money was more important to them than Christ, the risen Christ. <clears throat> Just terrible. Let's go back to Luke 24. <clears throat> Luke 24. Verse 12. Peter got up and ran. I think we'll see later on that when Peter went, after the women went, and Peter ran to the tomb that sometime after that time, Peter also had an encounter with Jesus. Verse 13, And behold, two of them were going that very day to the village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had, had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Jesus in his resurrected body, they weren't able to identify him. They didn't know who he was. And he said to them, Why are these, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. 
verse 18. Now, obviously, they didn't believe the women or they wouldn't be sad, right? If Jesus, you believe Jesus got up from the dead, you're, you're joyous. They're sad. They're leaving town. They're going home. They're leaving town. They don't believe the whole. They don't believe the women. They believe that his body was stolen. They don't know, but they don't believe he's raised from the dead. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to Jesus, are you only visiting Jerusalem and unaware of all the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, Jesus said to them, what things? And they said to him, you know, the things about Jesus of the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be sentenced to death and crucified. But we were hoping, we were hoping that he was, that he was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, these, this, it is the third day since these things happened, and some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and, not, and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it. It was exactly as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Well, isn't this nice? Jesus is walking with them. They're explaining to him everything that just happened to him. And their, their, their version of what happened to Jesus. Why would our Lord do this? I mean, if you or I were doing this, you would have went, you, <laughs> you know. I don't think we would have had quite the patience. <laughs> but Jesus did. But he finally says to them in uh, verse, where are we? O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe, all in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses, Jesus did this, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And if there's anything that would impress upon any of us, the significance and the importance of the scriptures, this one verse of scripture should be that. Jesus in his resurrected body, this would be the first full day he's up from the dead. In his resurrected body, he is, he's moving with two unbelieving disciples. They're on their way home because they don't believe he got up from the dead. Instead of, instead of saying to them, look at my body, I am he and all the rest, what he did with them, he took the scriptures and he went, and he's, well, he had it in his mind. He went to Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, and all the rest of the Old Testament, and explained to them the things written about him, elevating to us and helping us to see how vital and how important the Scriptures are. I mean, God magnified his word above his name. Jesus believed that. Jesus, on this great and glorious day that he was up from the dead, he put such emphasis, no, it was, his, it was his faith. He knew that it was the word that would pierce through their hearts to help them to understand. Him getting up, him being seen, and then the women telling him, that didn't work. I mean, one thing when Mary came, okay, Mary's crazy. Now all the girls come back, and they're all exuberant, they're all full of joy, and they think they're crazy. So Jesus says, well, let me tell you what the Word says. And that's the thing that got them. Verse 28, And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he was going further, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in and stayed with them. Our Lord had time on this day of glory to spend with these two guys. He sat in their home and ate with them. Again, there's room for all of us. There's room for all of us. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and poof, he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> and they said one to another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was what? Speaking to us while he was explaining 
the scriptures to us. Their heart burned as he explained the scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, how important should we, how, how much, what should be our attitude towards the scriptures? How important should it be for us to, to want to read the scriptures? And I could have come up here today and just said to you, he is risen. And then said amen and walk out the door. We could eat our Italian pastries and go home. Because basically that's all I'm saying to you. But I believe, I believe the scriptures are what we need to found our faith upon. I believe the scriptures are the most important, not my words, not my declaration, not even the declaration of someone that saw the risen, the risen Christ, but the scripture is what pierced their heart. And that's what Jesus revered. And that's what we should all. And you know, if you're like me, when I first came to reading the Bible, I thought, I don't understand any of this. Well, of course I didn't understand any of it. The only thing I, the stuff I understood wasn't written in the scripture. It was, well, it was, but told me not to do those things. So I started reading, and little by little, God taught. I don't care what your educational level is. I don't care with your, with your, you know, your race is. I don't care what your gender is. I don't care what your age is. If you want to know the truth, it's contained in the scriptures, and God will help you to understand it if you have a heart to read it. If you don't have a heart to read it, then, you know, it's not going to work. You're not going to see a bright light shining and an angel coming down and then you're going to believe. That didn't work. It's the scriptures. <laughs> verse 32, verse 33, and they were gone out. They were gone. They, then they got up and they, that very hour and they returned to Jerusalem and found gather, gathered together the eleven and all those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Well, that doesn't, they're not the ones that said that. The people that were, they were there, they ran in. We got something to tell you. But meantime, they're already talking, and Peter is saying, I've seen the risen Christ. And well, we saw him too. He's alive. <laughs> what a time. In verse 35, and they began to relate their experience on the road and how he, he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. And while they were telling these things, he, Jesus himself, stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. <laughs> I expect they probably needed that at that point. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do you... Do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it, because of their great joy, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? He did have a, quite a tough time here. He was probably a little bit hungry, I guess. I don't know. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. Now look at this, verse 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, and all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And what did he do? Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand what? The scripture. The scripture. It's always the scripture. Next week, we're going to start a series of teachings uh, that we're going to do here at the church. We're going to call it Tradition or Truth. On the first, that would be next Sunday, we're going to cover the, the, the topic of fiction or truth. We want, to, we want to impress upon those of you that participate the great integrity of the Scripture, the truth of the Scripture. It's, I, I, I've listened a lot this week to radio. I've listened a lot to different people, teachings on, on, the, on Jesus. And there's movies out and there's all of this stuff about this time of the year. But you know what? There isn't any of them that I've heard or that I've seen that line up with the Scripture. I mean, they're nice, they're dramatic, but they're not accurate. 
The only way to know the accurate truth is to come to the Scripture. And that's why we're going to put emphasis on the next four weeks on the integrity of the Scripture. The first thing that we're going to talk about is fiction or truth. And I'm going to do that by sharing with you what really happened with Judas, the one that betrayed him. When did he die? What happened to him and all the rest? I can assure you of this. If you haven't heard it from the Scripture, you've heard it wrong. Then on the 15th, we're going to look at the subject of Heavens for the birds. <laughs> Is there really a heaven? Is that where the dead go to heaven? Is that what the scriptures teach? We're going to see that according to the word. And then on the 22nd, what the hell? <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> Just yesterday, the Pope... Uh, it was in all the news that the Pope had said that there was no hell and everybody was in a, you know, that, they, that uh, people just disappear when they die and they, if they, they don't believe. And uh, so maybe now that the Pope said there's no hell, people will start believing there's no hell. I don't care what the Pope says or what you say. What does the Bible say? What the hell? I mean, let's find out. <laughs> and the scriptures will inform us on that subject. And then the last one... Uh, this is something that Mary Magdalene would have enjoyed on the 29th, angels and demons. Since she was involved with both in her life, <laughs> she saw her angels and demons were cast out of her. So come and, and join us for this because it will be a wonderful time. Verse 46, he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and be raised again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending you forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you shall stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the historical record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he got up from the dead, we too can get up from the dead. Because he got up, when he got up, we got up with him. When he, is, you know, when, when he suffered and died, we died with him. The old you died with him, and then the new you got up with him. And when he ascended, you ascended, and when he comes back, you'll be gathered together with him. Now, we, we've got to end by this. I'd like for everybody over here to say together in unison, he is risen. He is risen. I'd like everybody in the middle, no, everybody over here to say, He is risen. He is risen. I'd like for everybody in the middle to say, He is risen. He is risen. How wimpy. With some gusto. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. No, no, no. Everybody stand up. Now. We're going to do this quickly here. You ready? Here we go. He is risen. He is risen.